afternoon and welcome. I uh, would like to formally begin by recognizing that St. Mary's Academy resides on Treaty One land, which is the uh, First Nations territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And so we welcome you here. St. Mary's Academy welcomes you. I'm delighted to introduce you to, uh, to Dirk. He is one of the authors of the Common Prayer for the Joint Catholic Lutheran Commemoration of the 500 Years of Reformation. And he was the project officer for this commemorative liturgy celebrated on October 31st, 2016 with Pope Francis and the Lutheran World Federation. And I know as a community who dearly love Dirk and because he is at home here within us, I know that you will welcome him heartily to bring us this lecture today. Welcome, Dirk. Thank you, Elaine. This is uh, uh, probably, I've been more nervous for this event than I ever have been for an event, uh, because I know three quarters of you. Um, uh, or let's say I know all of you, uh, and uh, that just uh, ups the ante uh, considerably. Um, I owe so much to many of you in this room uh, for uh, my journey, and uh, I'm, I'm deeply grateful uh, to everyone uh, here. I want to talk uh, a little bit. I'm going to walk back and forth um, uh, between... Uh, the podium and the screen, talk a little bit about this event, um, which happened on October 31st, uh, 2016, uh, as Bishop Elaine just mentioned, the joint commemoration of the Reformation, 500 years of the Reformation. How is it possible that Pope Francis would join with the Lutheran leadership to give thanks for the Reformation. How is this, uh, how is this event uh, a possibility uh, in our day? I always joke, uh, for you Lutherans in the, in the crowd, I always joke that I never have to, for some reason, introduce Pope Francis, but I do have to introduce the Lutheran leadership to Lutherans. <laughs> Here we have Martin Junge, who's the uh, General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation. And on the other side of Pope Francis is Bishop Muni Bunan, who is the former president of the Lutheran World Federation. He's Bishop of Jerusalem, of the Holy Land, Palestine, and Jordan. And the local host was the Archbishop of the Church of Sweden, Archbishop Antje Jakelin. So how is it possible? What made this possible for Pope Francis uh, to be with Lutherans uh, on this, uh, to launch uh, the Reformation 500? Technically, we gathered on the 499th uh, anniversary, but in good biblical counting, uh, it was the eve of. Uh, uh, so we, we begin, we began the 500th year on uh, October 31st, 2016. We launched into uh, this year of, of, of commemoration. We go uh, in the immediate uh, history, uh, we go back, we need to go back to Vatican II, Pope John uh, the 23rd, calling uh, on the opening of the Vatican, Second Vatican Council back in 1959. It concluded its work in 1965. And during that council, several important uh, documents opened up possibilities of dialogue. Of course, John uh, the 23rd is known uh, for his openness. Um, we do not intend to conduct a trial of the past. We do not want to prove who was right or who was wrong. All we want to say is let us come together. Let us make an end of our divisions. 
this language of reconciliation that John the uh, John the Twenty Third um, used deeply marked uh, the ecumenical, the possibility of dialogue, uh, opened up many, many uh, possibilities of exchanges between uh, denominations, and, uh, and led to a very significant uh, document of the Vatican Council called Unitatis Reintegratio, which is the doctrine, which is the statement on ecumenism. In that uh, document, uh, the Catholic, uh, the Council Fathers wrote that the truly Christian gifts from our common heritage are to be found among the separated brethren, and that elements of sanctification um, are found in the other ecclesial communities. What, they, what that says, it's, it's, it's maybe sounds a bit theological jargon, but what they're, what they're saying is basically the Catholic Church is no longer equating itself solely or uniquely uh, with the body of Christ. The, the body of Christ is broader, uh, uh, wider than any particular uh, a Christian uh, denomination or, or identity. Uh, this, this then gave the, made it possible for a dialogue uh, to begin with the separated <coughs> brethren in the language of the, of the conciliar document, with other ecclesial communities. And the very first uh, dialogue to begin was that between uh, Lutherans and Catholics. Uh, barely had Unitatis Reintegratio been signed then in uh, 1965. The first um, uh, uh, very small groups were meeting already uh, in the United States. Uh, a couple of Lutheran professors came together with a couple of Catholic professors. Uh, they began to outline what a dialogue could look like and in 1966, so a year later, the International Dialogue was uh, formed and it had its first meeting in 1967. So the first, um, we're celebrating the 50 years also of that first international uh, Lutheran Catholic uh, dialogue. That dialogue worked on several key issues uh, that, uh, uh, of contention, of difference, uh, through uh, its first iterations, uh, through its first sessions, uh, culminating, uh, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, culminating 30 years later, or exactly 32 years later, in the signing of the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Uh, this, in that, uh, declaration, in that joint declaration, it is stated the Lutheran churches and the Roman Catholic Church have listened to the good news proclaimed in the Holy Scripture. <clears throat> this common listening together with the theological convert conversations of recent years has led to a shared understanding of justification. I don't think we've taken, Lutherans or Catholics have taken really to heart the significance of this document, uh, the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. It was um, uh, 30 years in the making. It was not without its difficulties. But in this document, uh, which is, by the way, the only official ecumenical, is the only do ecumenical document that has been officially received and uh, made into, um, uh, given a legal status, both within the Lutheran World Federation and in the Roman Catholic Church. And in that uh, document, uh, we state together that justification, yes, is by faith alone. We agree on this point. The, the disagreements, all of the condemnations of the 16th century are laid to rest. They are no longer binding on us. 
Now, the way we understand that justification or how justification is lived out in our communities can be very different. Lutherans will have one way of living it out. Catholics will have another understanding of that journey of faith. But in the heart of the matter, we both agree that uh, uh, justification, that we are reconciled with God through God's own action, through faith alone, through Christ alone. The, um, uh, I, I didn't uh, put that quote up actually on the screen. I put this other one up because it too is, is significant. Um, because it uh, gives the basis for our common understanding. It is when we both listen to scripture together that uh, we are able to discern uh, our commonality, our deep, uh, our rootedness in faith. It is in listening to the good news proclaimed in Holy Scripture. After the, the signing, the, the signing of the Joint Declaration happened in 1999. Uh, immediately afterwards um, was the question, we, we weren't thinking about it perhaps uh, at that point, 2000, 2001. We weren't thinking of 2017 and the 500th anniversary. But uh, people on the international dialogue had already begun wondering, well, now that we have this joint declaration, uh, is it possible for us to be able to say something or do something together uh, when, we're, when we approach the 500th anniversary? Uh, through a further discussion and, and some work, uh, another document was published about four years ago, uh, From Conflict to Communion. In this uh, um, document, this is a unique document in, in the study documents of the commission. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried reading one of the uh, documents coming out of the Lutheran Catholic Joint Commission, but they put even theologians to sleep. Um, uh, this one is very different. Uh, this one was written really for um, lay theologians, for the inexperienced uh, theologian. It was meant for study in parishes. It was meant to be engaged by parishes together, Lutheran and Catholic parishes together. And what it does is trace a little bit the history of commemorations, but most importantly, it enters into a, a fine analysis of uh, who Martin Luther is to, uh, for us today. It takes into account all of the recent scholarship, everything that has been done both on Lutheran and Catholic side in terms of Luther research and brings it together in some new insights into, uh, into the man uh, Martin Luther. It then goes on into dealing with several of the key uh, doctrinal issues between Lutherans and Catholics and uh, where we stand in our agreement or in our differences on those topics. And it ends with uh, imperatives, five ecumenical imperatives, five steps we can take now uh, together. I've called this uh, uh, little booklet a, a spiritual and a theological uh, challenge. And I do that because it is challenging both uh, to Lutherans and to Catholics in terms of reassessing, reassessing the stories we tell about ourselves and our history or the story we tell about our fellow Christians, Catholic or, or Lutheran. It is engaging us in, uh, or it's asking us to look carefully at the history and at the myths that we rely on, which may uh, not always be so helpful 
in terms of, of uh, defining history and where we want to go at this point uh, in history. So it begins to do that sort of what I call a deconstruction of some of our myths. It begins to do that with uh, uh, Martin Luther. Of course, um, you know this story of Luther, the defiant monk, uh, or let me go back a step, the monk who was in anguish, uh, guilt-ridden, incapable of doing anything, um, uh, stuck in his monastic cell, um, and then all of a sudden having a brilliant insight, namely justification by faith alone, and then going out and defiantly hammering the 95 theses on a door in Wittenberg, on the church door in Wittenberg. Now, I don't know what Professor Wenger had said to you last week about the nailing or the mailing or the posting, whatever <laughs> term you want to use. I guess I prefer posting of the 95 Theses because that leaves it vague. It could be, could be nailing or mailing. Uh, but uh, Tim and I have had many discussions over the years about it. and. Uh, though we agree on many things, we also disagree on some things. It's just too bad we aren't in the same room to discuss it with you. <laughs> um, um, the Luther, let me put it this way, Martin Luther himself never, ever mentions nailing the 95 Theses. When he writes about the 95 Theses, he writes about mailing them. He sent them to the Cardinal of Mainz, and to his own uh, bishop in Brandenburg, which is now the Berlin area. And why? Why did he do that? Because he was inviting into a discussion. He wanted to discuss these particular theses. He had some deep concerns about church practice, and he wanted to propose a debate how we can uh, change, how we could reform, how we, how we might eliminate some uh, practices. And so where does he begin? Well, he begins by calling on a dialogue, for a dialogue with the cardinal and the bishop. Well, uh, then what happens, of course, I call it the WikiLeaks of the 16th century. <laughs> Somebody got a hold of these and translated them into German. Oh yeah, uh, here's another uh, uh, important piece. Um, you know, you might, uh, against, I would say, another argument against the name, so this is just a footnote. Uh, against the nailing of the 95 theses onto a door, Luther wrote them all in Latin, right? 60% of Luther's writings are in Latin. Uh, unlike what we think that most are in German. No, they were mostly in Latin. People of the time uh, could not read Latin other than academics. Uh, and very few people could even read, even if they had been in German. Uh, so another argument against uh, the nailing. Uh, but we'll leave that aside for now. Um, so WikiLeaks gets a hold of them and translates them and then prints them and starts uh, distributing them uh, in more educated circles around Germany. And of course, they take off like wildfire. Uh, it is unstoppable now. Uh, very interestingly, Luther, at the end of his life, is asked to write a preface to his Latin writings and in that preface, uh, he actually it's, uh, he doesn't write a preface. He writes a short autobiography uh, where he goes through those first years of the Reformation. And the way he describes it there, uh, that's, by the way, where we know he mailed them. Uh, he writes about mailing the 95 Theses. But then also there, he writes about how they got out into the public. And then it was like waves, like a storm that came over him. And he was, he was just uh, blown away by what was happening. He couldn't control it. He said, I lost control of the events. The events 
submerged me uh, is the language he uses as though he was being drowned by all of these events. This was not what he was anticipating. He was anticipating a dialogue. He was anticipating perhaps an ecclesial dialogue with church administrators. He was certainly looking for an academic dialogue, a disputation, as they would call it, where he would debate with his, his fellow uh, colleagues and his students the ideas that he proposed. Uh, but now this has taken on a whole other uh, dimension. Dialogue, of course, didn't happen in the 16th century. Uh, Luther met with Cardinal Cajetan, who was the greatest Thomistic <coughs> scholar of the day. And though the Cardinal understood where Luther was going with his theses, he was not able to open a door to, to, to reform. And, and dialogue ended with just one meeting. Luther kept hoping for that reform. Well into the 1520s, uh, he's still hoping for uh, uh, an acceptance. Even after being excommunicated, he's still hoping for the possibility of presenting the, the insights, his insights to a council. Well, then in 1530, we get the Augsburg, Augsburg Confession, which is a moment of possible reconciliation. And I find it very interesting for, um, for any of you who've looked uh, closely at the Augsburg Confession. It's not a document that um, identifies Lutherans over and against the Catholics. Actually, what the Augsburg Confession is doing is arguing, look how Catholic we are. This is what the Augsburg Confession is doing. Look how Catholic we are. None of our practices uh, are anti-Catholic, are against the tradition. This is what propelled Luther forward, uh, this desire for reform. Uh, and then, uh, finally, also for reconciliation. He kept that hope well into the 1530s, probably even into the 1540s. But again, that dialogue didn't happen. When the Council of Trent began meeting, or was called in 1545, a year before Luther's death, um, Luther and the Reformed Party, of course, were not invited to that council. We might say that the dialogue that Luther sought in 1517 and the early 1500s, the dialogue Luther sought finally happened 450 years later when uh, Pope John XXIII opened the Vatican Council and the Lutheran Catholic dialogue was made possible. Finally, there was that table of uh, a dialogue space uh, could happen. So in that sense, we're continuing on a tradition today that Luther had hoped to see uh, in the 16th century. The conclusions in From Conflict to Communion also challenge us, and I'm just going to highlight one of these in terms of who this man was. Um, I, you can already see if we have to rethink some of the stories we tell about Luther, it's then not so easy for us as Lutherans to hide behind a kind of um, hero uh, who's only goal is to create uh, some new form of being Christian. No, uh, he was actually trying to revive uh, the ancient tradition. Uh, going back to Bernard of Clairvaux, going back to Augustine, going back to scripture. Um, here, just another little footnote. Um, of course, when Luther writes, the source he cites the most is Holy Scripture. 
the source that is second most cited by Luther is Bernard of Clairvaux, the great Catholic mystic of the uh, 11th century. It was in Bernard of Clairvaux that Luther discovered argumentation from scripture and where Luther uh, discovers in 1509 already, not 1517, in 1509, Luther discovers uh, Bernard's writing where he uh, describes how justification happens through faith. Luther discovers a, a, a tradition uh, in, Catho in his own Catholic upbringing uh, that um, he is now trying to revive or bring back <coughs> into the life of the church. So the document from conflict to communion is able to come to a, a very strong conclusion which challenges us again. Luther overcame within himself a Catholicism that was not fully Catholic. Luther overcame within himself a Catholicism that was not fully Catholic. The challenge to Roman Catholics in this statement, and uh, uh, just a reminder, this statement is made by both Catholic and Lutheran theologians and is an approved text by the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation. Uh, um, so it's just not some individual's idea. Uh, this is an approved text. Um, for Catholics, the challenge, of course, is to recognize that Luther uh, is not the heretic that he's so often depicted to be, uh, but uh, that uh, the church of his day was not fully Catholic, was not living out its mission to be church as it could have. Kurt Cardinal Koch, the president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, said it uh, about well, six months, half a year ago, said it perhaps more bluntly than this, the cardinal said, Luther, Martin Luther was right, and the church of his day did not know how to respond. <laughs> Martin Luther was, this is the cardinal, president of the Pontifical Council, Martin Luther was right, and the church of his day did not know how to respond. So to come for Catholics to the realization that the church, there, there was a deep need for reform in the church that Luther named. Unfortunately, the church didn't know how to engage that or engage Luther. On the Lutheran side, we're all, Lutherans are also challenged with this statement because what is it telling us? Well, I already gave you a hint a couple of minutes ago. We, when we march under the banner, justification by faith alone, we have to come to the realization that that's a very deeply Catholic insight. It did not fall from the sky onto Martin Luther for the first time in Christian history in 1517 but has a deep rootedness in the Catholic theological tradition that Luther was raised in. So we too have to wrap our minds around uh, the, the, the idea that what we take as, as, um, I, as, as an identifying piece for the Lutheran Church is also uh, simply a very deeply Catholic uh, intuition or insight. By the way, uh, Luther, in that little autobiographical piece at the end of his life, specifically states that he had no eureka moment. It came through long study, writing, prayer, and singing, particularly singing the Psalms, uh, uh, which he would have done as a monk quite regularly. It came through a deep uh, study and a, a meditation on the tradition uh, 
uh, in which he uh, had been raised. So we come to uh, a new assessment of who Luther is. This opens up the possibility now for the 500th commemoration to be viewed or to be engaged in a very different way uh, than in uh, the way it was done in the past in that very polemical fashion. Just a, a brief history of those commemorations, if you can. This is 1617, the first hundredth year, the first uh, hundredth anniversary of the Reformation. In wonderful polemical spirit, you see Luther not only nailing, but now actually writing the 95 Theses on the door. And if you follow his huge feather pen, the tip of it knocks off the Pope's crown. <laughs> This is uh, the Lutheran statement in 1617. Pope Paul V at the time responded by saying, by calling for the eradication of all the heretics. This was the type of polemics uh, for the first centennial. For you history buffs out there, what happened in 1618? The Thirty Years' War started, the worst religious violence in European history. Lutherans killing Catholics, Catholics killing Lutherans for 30 years. 1717, the 200th anniversary, Lutherans were infighting. What's new? Huh? Uh, <laughs> couldn't come to agreement among themselves already back then. Lutheran pietists and Lutheran orthodox were not in agreement. 1817, the 300th anniversary, the King of Prussia uses it as an excuse to force the union of all Protestants in Germany under one, in one church, the United Church, uh, so the king uses the 300th anniversary for his own political advantage. We still actually suffer from that decision of the 300th anniversary with uh, disunity among Lutherans uh, because it was as a result of that forced union in 1817 that a bunch of Lutherans left uh, Prussia and immigrated to the U.S. to form the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, so we still have the consequences of that uh, 300th anniversary. We can do the next one. The 400th anniversary happened during World War I. And the German Kaiser uh, was all too happy to turn Luther into a war hero. Uh, to use Luther as a way to motivate the troops. He didn't put Luther on the coin. Uh, he put Luther's protector, the elector Frederick, on the coin. But all around the edge of the coin, we can read, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is our God. Of course, here, a mighty fortress is used in totally opposite sense that Luther uh, uh, meant it. Uh, this is the 400th anniversary. A great German theologian, Hermann Sasse, uh, wrote um, after compiling a bit of information on all of these uh, commemorations of the Reformation, uh, wrote a little warning to Lutherans. He said, Beware of Reformation commemorations. <laughs> They've never ended very well. Uh, so finally, we have a chance to do it differently. Uh, finally, in a global age where, uh, for example, I don't know the statistics for the Catholic Church, but for the Lutheran Church in the Lutheran World Federation, we know there are more Lutherans in the global south than in the global north. Uh, we're in a very different context than we've ever been in before. And uh, in an ecumenical age, um, 
ecumenical, uh, the ecumenical movement that began in the early 20th century, but which was then spurred on uh, by Pope John the 23rd, very different, which allows us uh, to, these are the words of Pope Francis uh, last year, while the past cannot be changed, what is remembered and how it is remembered can be transformed. We pray for the healing of our wounds and of the memories that cloud our view of one another. The challenge to us is not to deny the past, uh, not to, to pretend it didn't happen, we can't, the divisions, the violence, the separation, but how we tell the story, how we tell our history, how we remember it uh, uh, can be uh, different. Uh, and that is uh, the challenge uh, that we're invited into and that comes to an expression during the joint uh, commemoration of the Reformation in the prayer uh, last year. This is the Cathedral of Lund in Sweden. A few years ago, the Vatican uh, contacted the Lutheran World Federation uh, following up on all of this, uh, the work that had been done and on the book From Conflict to Communion and stated uh, that they would like to in some way do a public um, event uh, together recognizing uh, the Reformation. It was a gift uh, that the Catholic Church would come to the Lutheran World Federation. It was a little harder. The Lutheran World Federation uh, really wanted to do something together on Reformation Day, but it would have been a bit pretentious to go to the Vatican and ask that. It's very different if they come and ask, which is exactly what they did. At, this, at that point, we didn't know that Pope Francis uh, would be involved himself. Um, but the Catholic Church wanted to mark the Reformation anniversary. So um, the idea came about, uh, again, surprisingly, uh, because usually when academics get together, they think of a conference, a symposium, lectures, you know, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, but instead, the idea came, well, let us do a liturgy together. Uh, let us, uh, let us pray together, uh, giving thanks and, and lamenting uh, for uh, the, uh, giving thanks for the Re uh, Reformation and lamenting uh, the division that uh, uh, ensued. Uh, the Lund was chosen, interestingly enough, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the recognition that the Reformation is bigger than Germany. Uh, Germany already had enough things going on. We didn't need to do something else in Germany. Actually, the Lutheran World Federation had hoped to do something in the Global South, but that became a little more uh, complicated. Um, but so Sweden seemed like a good choice. The Lutheran Church is strong in Sweden. Uh, there's a long tradition, and the Cathedral of Lund is also the place where the Lutheran World Federation began in 1947. So this year is also the 70th anniversary of the Lutheran World uh, Federation. When I was asked to start uh, writing this liturgy for the uh, joint commemoration, I asked myself, well, what do we have most in common? Well, obviously we have uh, the pattern of liturgy uh, of Sunday in common. We gather, we hear the word, we celebrate the sacrament, the meal, and we are sent forth. Unfortunately, though, we can't yet celebrate the meal together. So what other pattern do we have together? Well, the pattern of daily prayer uh, is one that we share, uh, going back to the early church. And the pattern of daily prayer is very simple, as you know. Uh, it consists really of two elements, of psalmody and of prayer. In, as we sing together, as we meditate on the psalms, 
We are immersed in God's word. God's word shapes us, shapes a deep inner life within us. The, the words of the Psalms give us a language for our prayer. They give us a language for ourselves, actually, for understanding who we are as, as human beings before God. They open up to us a, a, a field of emotions that we might never have ever thought possible, uh, uh, opening up horizons for us, uh, all shaped by God's word. Bonhoeffer uh, wrote, the Psalms is the place where God teaches us to pray hmm, on that very regular basis, which is why he called his psalm commentary the prayer book of the Bible. God gives us the words for our prayers. And then intercessory prayer, well, what's intercessory prayer? Intercessory prayer is now looking outwards. Because what do we do in prayer? We name the suffering of the world. It's like in our sanctuary, we open the windows and the doors to hear the cry out in the street of the suffering world. And that cry comes into our sanctuary, into our liturgy, in our prayers. And again, as Bonhoeffer wrote, when we pray for that suffering, of the suffering of our neighbor, when we pray for that in our assemblies, we can't go out into the world and ignore that suffering. So you have this double movement. You have psalmody, this nurturing of a deep inner life in God's word, and then this movement outwards towards the other, towards the neighbor in prayer. The Psalms themselves have that uh, uh, structure, as you know, uh, thanks, uh, lament often, beginning with lament, moving to thanksgiving, and concluding with vows or commitment. Some Psalms are just pure thanksgiving. Only one Psalm is pure lament, Psalm 88. Never makes the shift from lament to thanksgiving. Psalm 88 that we use uh, on Monday, Thursday as we're stripping the altar. Uh, but most of the Psalms have this three-part structure, uh, lament, thanksgiving, uh, vows, or commitment. So that too then informed the shape of this liturgy, except rather than beginning with lament, it didn't seem right to begin the Reformation commemoration with lament, uh, we switched around thanksgiving and lament. So we begin with thanksgiving, giving thanks for the Reformation, for the many insights of the Reformation, moving into repentance, lament, and then to a commitment of uh, going forward uh, together. Uh, the key uh, actors, uh, or presiders, I should say, um, uh, were um, the three you've seen, and the fourth one, uh, uh, Cardinal Koch, uh, the president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Uh, uh, Cardinal Koch and Martin Junge were the two readers, and uh, Bishop Yunnan and Pope Francis were uh, the presiders, per se. Uh, so it be begins uh, with the thanksgiving uh, oh, before I go there, just a footnote uh, on this image. I think this is a, a very noteworthy image. Um, uh, and here is a, a place where symbols speak louder than words could ever uh, speak. Um, when we were discussing what would um, the liturgical vestments be, uh, I had made the proposal that uh, we just have simple albs and stoles so that there would be really no sign of ecclesial rank or hierarchy. And everyone agreed to this. Uh, then, uh, a few a couple of weeks before the event, I realized, oh dear, we haven't decided yet on the color of the stoles. So I wrote to uh, the person in the Vatican who I was working with, uh, 
Monsignor Guido Marini, who's the Pope's assistant, and said, well, Lutherans would wear red on Reformation Day, sign of renewal, renewing the church, the Holy Spirit, making all things new. Uh, could we wear red? Uh, and uh, Monsignor Marini didn't respond. Um, usually he responded right away. This time he didn't. I waited one day, second day, third day, fourth day. Finally, I decided I better write again, uh, which I did. And I said, oh, I understand red is a little hard, perhaps. Uh, but you would wear green, but, you know, I know you would wear green, but because it's a festive occasion, maybe we could wear white, white stoles. Well, within an hour, Monsignor Marini responded saying, no, 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 rosso, rosso, red, red, it will be red. That was one of the few times where I realized uh, in most cases he could make his own decisions regarding the liturgy. In this one, he had to consult with Pope Francis. Um, and the Pope's response was, no, I will wear red. Uh, that Pope Francis wears the red stole on Reformation Day says as much as all of the words that were spoken uh, during that liturgy. Um, another little footnote, funny story. Um, of course, you know how conspiracy theories work on the internet. Somebody starts something and it goes on and on and on. So, of course, everyone, well, not everyone, but the conspiracy theories were all saying, oh, look at Cardinal Koch. He's showing his defiance of Pope Francis. <laughs> he's showing that he's not in agreement because he's not in an olive and red stole. Uh, well, uh, the true story is the following. Uh, they arrived about half an hour, 20 minutes before the liturgy began. And as you know, it was broadcast worldwide, live streamed worldwide. And Cardinal Koch comes running into the, our little sacristy and says, Dirk, Dirk, Matthias forgot to pack my Alban stole. <laughs> Matthias is his assistant. Uh, well, it was too late to find him in Alban a stole at that point. Uh, so luckily, as a cardinal, he had red on, right? Uh, <laughs> So uh, Martin Junge and um, Cardinal Koch began by giving thanks for the Reformation. I don't need to read to you what Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther, uh, Martin Junge uh, wrote, uh, said, because it's easy for Lutherans to give thanks for the Reformation. But here are the words that uh, Cardinal uh, Koch uh, spoke. Just part, not all, the final sentence that he spoke. Together, Catholics and Lutherans rejoice in the truly Christian gifts that they have both received and rediscovered in various ways through the impulses and renewal of the Reformation. These gifts are reason for thanksgiving. And then uh, Bishop Yunan led us in a prayer of thanksgiving, and then we sang a, a song of thanksgiving and moved into repentance. And here Martin Junge and Cardinal Koch again uh, expressed the reasons for the lament, uh, for the repentance. Catholics and Lutherans frequently not only misunderstood but also exaggerated and caricatured their opponents in order to make them look ridiculous. And Cardinal Koch, Catholics and Lutherans accepted that the gospel was mixed with political and economic interests of those in power. Their failures resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. We deeply regret the evil things that Catholics and Lutherans have mutually done to one another. And then Pope Francis and Bishop Yunan led us in a public order of confession, bringing the burdens of the guilt of the past, confessing the ways that we perpetuate the divisions uh, today. And then uh, they gave us a joint absolution 
that absolution was then embodied by the whole congregation in the sharing of the peace, where, uh, as Luther understood the sharing of the peace as that moment of doing the individual, the personal ab uh, absolution. Uh, for Luther, the greeting of peace wasn't just a, a handshake and a greeting. It was truly the peace of Christ be with you is you are forgiven. You are in Christ's peace. Uh, we are together in that peace. It was a moment of absolution. So that is shared by the whole um, assembly together at this moment. Uh, and very interestingly, Pope Francis went straight over to the Archbishop of uh, the Church of Sweden, Antje Jakelin, to embrace her, not only shake her hand, uh, but to embrace her. That was a very significant moment as well. Especially, as you may know, there's a lot of resistance to what Pope Francis is doing uh, today in the Catholic Church, resistance from within the Catholic Church. And there were many who did not want uh, to have any or too many public photos of Pope Francis with the Archbishop of Sweden uh, because, um, well, there's many reasons for it, but um, <laughs> I won't get into them all. Uh, but in his typical fashion, knowing that resistance, uh, he went straight for her and not only shook her hand, but at, you know, warmly embraced her. The Archbishop was then uh, uh, the reader of the Gospel uh, which is uh, John, with the, the gospel we chose was John 15, 1 to 5. Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, and concluding with that uh, statement by Jesus, without me you can do nothing. Uh, so this may be surprising to some Lutherans, uh, but uh, the most cited text um, in the book of Concord is not, you know, Romans or Galatians, uh, any texts from Paul. It is actually this gospel text, John 15, 1 to 5. Without me, without Christ, we can do nothing. Then uh, Bishop, uh, not Bishop, sorry, Martin Junge, uh, preached, and he was followed then by a second sermon of like that, two sermons in a liturgy, but we made sure they were short, only, <laughs> only five minutes each. Um, uh, uh, Martin Junge and then uh, Pope Francis. In Pope Francis's sermon, uh, again, he reiterated the thanksgiving for the Reformation and the gifts of renewal. Um, and he called upon uh, the spiritual experience and the spiritual quest of Martin Luther, uh, wondering, asking, um, if only that same spiritual desire, that same spiritual quest to find a merciful God would animate all of our lives, would animate each one of us. His uh, sermon ended with a significant statement uh, calling on us to, calling on what he calls the primordial intuition of God's people who naturally yearn to be one. This has been a big theme in Pope Francis's uh, theology and in his public discourse, calling on uh, the people of God to uh, express their deep yearning uh, for God's mercy and uh, to be one. In the Catholic tradition that's called in Latin the sensus fidei, the common sense of faith. And Pope Francis has been calling on that more and asking bishops and theologians to take that more into account, that deep yearning of the people of God. Uh, that should be a significant part of our way forwards together, uh, taking that 
uh, seriously. He's also joked about it um, on the Dialogue Commission, uh, the theologians on the Dialogue Commission, he said, um, if the theologians can't hurry up with their work, uh, he's going to exile us to, a, to an island uh, and, the, and the ch to keep working and the church will just keep on going, right? <laughs> so when we, met, when we met last summer, we were all kind of talking about this because it was clearly an admon admonition for us to work a bit quicker. Uh, we were talking about it and all we could conclude was, as long as he sends us to a Greek island, we'll, we're fine. <laughs> we wouldn't mind that. Um, the uh, sermon was then followed by the reading of uh, the five ecumenical imperatives that are found at the end of uh, the book, From Conflict to Communion, and these, uh, a Lutheran and a Catholic read each of the five, and after each reading, a child went up from the baptismal font uh, up to the, high, uh, to the high altar to light one of five candles, uh, so that there were then the five uh, candles uh, lit. We can't go through all of these five commitments. I'll just uh, read the first and the last one. Catholics and Lutherans should always begin from the perspective of unity and not from the point of view of division in order to strengthen what is held in common even though the differences are more easily seen and experienced. But in all of our work, in our dialogue, in our encounters, uh, and this is not just uh, in terms of church meetings or, or um, theological dialogues, but this is on the street as we engage each other as Lutherans, as Catholics, as Christians, uh, with all denominations, that we do not begin from the perspective of what divides us, but rather let's start with what do we have in common and how can we build on that. And the final commitment, Catholics and Lutherans should witness together to the mercy of God in proclamation and service to the world. I find that one a very uh, interesting, very challenging. We've done a lot in terms of common service. Lutherans and Catholics have worked together in many ways in, in crisis situations uh, for refugees, when natural disasters have struck. We have worked together, but here we're also talking about um, witnessing together to the mercy of God in proclamation. Uh, how do we together uh, proclaim uh, Jesus Christ? After the uh, imperatives were read, um, Pope Francis and Bishop Yunan signed a joint statement Uh, committing ourselves, committing the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation to these five imperatives, but also, um, also uh, at the, near the end, as we were working on this joint statement, um, near the end of the editorial process, Pope Francis wanted to add a paragraph that had to do with Eucharistic sharing. He wanted that um, we also commit ourselves to seeking, to really making uh, Eucharistic sharing a top priority for the, our, our ecumenical discussions uh, going forward. This is the paragraph that then was developed. Many members of our communities yearn to receive the Eucharist at one table as the concrete expression of full unity. We experience the pain of those who share their whole lives but cannot share God's redeeming presence at the Eucharistic table. We acknowledge our joint pastoral responsibility to respond to the spiritual thirst and hunger of our people to be one in Christ. We long for this wound in the body of Christ to be healed. This is the goal of our ecumenical endeavors. 
which we wish to advance also by renewing our commitment to theological dialogue. A second joint statement was issued a couple of weeks ago on the 31st of October, reiterating uh, that uh, the importance of now focusing our discussions on the question of Eucharistic sharing. This is the cross uh, that was uh, painted uh, for uh, the joint commemoration by a Salvadoran artist that brought together the different themes of the, of the liturgy and of the text. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, of barely uh, the world in God's hands, uh, the vine uh, growing, the baptismal font, and then all peoples of all cultures, all ethnicities, uh, moving towards uh, the table. And notice the significant statement that, uh, here in this, in this image. Christ is alone at the table, inviting all people. It's not the Catholics at the table inviting the Lutherans, or the Lutherans at the table inviting the Catholics. Christ alone is at the table, inviting us all to this table. After the um, uh, liturgy, we moved into a stadium in the neighboring city of Malmö uh, because the cathedral was not big enough to hold everybody. And in that uh, arena, uh, there was the signing again of a document, the Declaration of Intent between uh, Caritas Internationalis and the Lutheran World and Lutheran World Service, Lutheran World Service and and Caritas Internationalis are the two largest humanitarian aid agencies, as you know, in the world, next to, next alongside the Red Cross, um, and they have worked occasionally on projects together. If they found themselves in in a disaster area, they would work together. But this declaration of intent um, uh, says, uh, commits both agencies now to actually strategically planning together. So working more and more closely uh, on different uh, problems that uh, confront the worlds today. And to do it uh, right from the start, to do it together, not just by happenstance, but to actually plan our work uh, together. That's already had fruits in uh, a number of places, including in the Twin Cities, uh, which is interesting. Um, this is a, a, a little footnote again. Uh, when the joint prayer, when the common prayer was live streamed at uh, Luther Seminary organized an event um, in the big auditorium, about 200 people came to watch uh, the live streaming of the common prayer. And among the 200 people, uh, our, the our Catholic Archbishop Bernard Hebda came along with the whole group of Catholics to also watch it. So we had the two Lutheran bishops, the Archbishop, uh, uh, all sitting together. Um, and the bishops have really uh, moved quickly to getting Lutheran social services in Minnesota and Catholic charities in the Twin Cities to work on the question of youth and family homelessness. Uh, so that's become, uh, it's taking on some already um, concrete action there uh, in terms of a common witness and service uh, together. The question that is before us now as we look into the next 500 years, into the next steps, well, in a way the joint statement has already suggested uh, one area, a very important area that we have to take into consideration and that is the yearning to be one at the table. This is going to require some theological reframing of the Eucharistic question and here again, Pope Francis has opened a way for us uh, um, 
in a, in a meeting with Lutherans in Rome, he was asked by a Lutheran woman married to a Roman Catholic exactly um, when would they be able to participate together uh, at the Lord's Supper. And Pope Francis responded. First he responded rather kind of lightly. Um, it was, uh, there was a big crowd and in the front row of the crowd was Cardinal Walter Casper. Cardinal Walter Casper is probably the foremost ecumenical theologian in the Catholic Church today and is a close advisor to Pope Francis. So first he has to just acknowledge that Cardinal Casper is in the front row. So the Pope, I'm quoting the Pope now, the question on sharing the Lord's Supper isn't easy for me to respond to. Above all, in front of a theologian like Cardinal Casper. <laughs> then, the second sentence, he reverses entirely the dialogue uh, of 500 years. He says, I ask myself, is sharing the Lord's Supper the end of a path, or is it the viaticum for walking together? What he does there is saying the Eucharist, sharing the Eucharist is perhaps not just the goal at the very end when we finally have full communion. No, we need to share the Eucharist together now as we walk together towards ever fuller communion. It's a total shift in the framing of the question, uh, which is going to challenge uh, the dialogues uh, deeply as we go forward. The end of the meeting, a very young person, only a young person would dare ask this question, um, uh, asked uh, Pope Francis, well, who is better, Lutherans or Catholics? <laughs> <laughs> and Pope Francis hesitated a moment, looked at the young person, and said, better? They're better together. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>